Hi, everyone. Welcome to Making the Grade. I'm Michelle Edmonds from Idaho News 6. We are so glad you could join us on this Tuesday morning here to talk about all things related to education. And it is a busy morning yet again is Kevin Richard from Idaho Education News. Good morning, Kevin. How are you? Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? Really good, considering, you know, we're kind of in the midst of this crazy one day off, one day on kind of learning situation in my house. But so far, so good, I have to say. So it's home day at your house, right? It's... It is home day. So if we get interrupted, parents, you understand what it's like to be trying to work from home and manage children. So yep. we might just have visitors. Who knows? <laughs> so let's the jump right in. Right? You're very sweet. Uh, we would love to hear your comments, your questions, your thoughts as kids have gone back into the classroom throughout a lot of the state of Idaho, at least part time. If your kids are still online, we'd love to hear how that's going. So leave us some comments. And I would like to mention, Kevin, as we start making the grade today, that we would love to hear if anybody has suggestions and not just open the school suggestions, but if you're a teacher or an administrator and you've seen somebody do something that's really critical, really good, if you're a parent and you've gotten a workaround on Microsoft Teams, I'd love to hear from you. So whatever you have out there, we'd like to hear from parents as well. And as we start that though, I wanna jump into the dollars and cents because there really could be some good news for Idaho education when it comes to the bottom line of the budget, Kevin. Tell us about what's coming with the CARES Act. Well, potentially a, a big infusion of federal dollars going into schools and also going into uh, in, into households. Uh, Governor Little announced a plan on Friday that would put close to $150 million of federal funding into education support. The big chunk of that money, the bigger chunk of that money is $99 million that would go straight into the state's education budget. And if that $99 million number sounds familiar to you, it should be, because back in the summer, Governor Little cut $99 million out of the K-12 budget as a result of the declining tax revenues, uh, the recession that we've uh, fallen into in the past few months as a result of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So the $99 million of federal money would be basically a dollar for dollar replacement uh, of the state dollars that were cut out of the K-12 budget. Now, we've talked about this before, Kevin. The governor did 5% across the board in cuts, mm -hmm. and that's where that money was coming from. Most of that money was earmarked for the career ladder for teacher raises along the career ladder that's been in place for years now. So if the federal money's coming back in, will teachers see that money go back into the pay raises? Not necessarily, and this is where it gets confusing. So when the governor announced his plan to cut the $99 million out of K-12, he was very specific about what he wanted to see cut, what he wanted to see put on hold, and the biggest item that he put on hold was teacher pay raises. About $26.6 .6 million that had been earmarked for teacher pay raises, he put that on hold. Now, you would think that the $99 million would replace the $99 million in cuts, that's not how it's going to work. What's going to happen with this money, and you know, I, I should say that it's not a done deal. Uh, a gubernatorial committee has to sign off on this idea of using the ninety-nine million dollars of federal money. But that's you know that's likely to occur. I, I would be surprised if it didn't happen today. So, assuming for the sake of argument that it does happen, the ninety-nine mil the ninety-nine million dollars would go to school districts, would go to charter schools, and it would be up to them to decide how to spend the money within federal guidelines, and it's fairly loose, they've got a good deal of latitude with what uh, they could do with this federal money. It'll be up to school districts and charters to decide, well, do they want to put it into teacher pay raises? Do they want to put it into salaries? Do they want to put it into adding teachers, uh, replacing teachers who didn't come back because of the pandemic? That's a, a big concern that Governor Little raised when he announced this on Friday. Uh, really, the schools could put this money into just about any purpose that they want to it's going to come with very few strings attached from the state level there are some federal strings attached the big one being that the money has to be spent this calendar year the other one is that uh, if the money would have to be spent to to offset some sort of a coronavirus related loss but even with that there's a lot of latitude so that's a long answer to a short question and and the you know the short answer to the question is not necessarily. It won't necessarily 
go into teacher pay raises. So when you did your math homework yeah. on this story, Kevin, and looked at the literal dollars and cents of it, how are we doing in the state of Idaho when it comes to funding education if you added in these millions of dollars that could now be coming or are coming to the state from the federal government? Well, the governor is talking about how the state's education support, and he uses the word support, I want to, I'll get there, has really increased this year. And technically speaking, he's right. When you factor in all this CARES Act money, and we're talking about $264 million of federal money that's going to go into K-12 in one fashion or another this budget year. That's a lot of money. That, that does pencil out to about 10% of the K-12 budget. So when the governor says that education support, K-12 support has increased by 10% this budget year, that is accurate. But there are a couple asterisks that you need to attach here. Without this federal money, without this 264 million that's going into K-12, and that's just the money going to K-12, you, you're not increasing state funding for education. In fact, state funding is probably gonna drop a little bit. The federal money is, it really accounts for the increase in education support. And why am I saying support? Because this isn't really money that's necessarily going into the classroom. It's not education funding in that traditional sense that it goes into you know, teacher salaries, it goes into staffing, it goes into uh, benefits for teachers, it goes into textbooks and busing and all the things that are you know, traditional education spending. A lot of this CARES Act money is going to support schools that isn't directly into the classroom. Uh, a big chunk of the money that uh, the governor talked about on Friday, and we'll get to it here in a moment, is a grant program to help parents pay for technology, pay for learning materials for students who are learning online. That's $50 million. Not in the classroom. It is education support in that sense of the word, but it's not money for classrooms. You're putting $20 million into uh, reimbursing teachers and staff for coronavirus testing. Again, that's not money into the classroom, but it is money to support teachers and staff and, and help them get tested before they go into the classroom, before they go into, go into work. So it's education support. It's being backfilled with a lot of federal money. If it all sounds confusing, I do walk through it. I've got a story that I posted at idahoednews.org, posted it this morning, where we break it down line item by line item. Line item. Where did all this money go? for K-12 and for higher education? How is it being spent? And you know, we, we get at this uh, contention that this is a 10% spending increase for K-12 and why it is and why it isn't exactly the spending increase like we've talked about in the past. Well, and as many times we've talked about, Kevin, school districts are a little wary when it comes to one-time funds too, coming in, whether it be from the federal government or the state level, because they can't necessarily replicate those funds the next year. So I'm sure there's going to be much debate over whether or not to spend that money on teacher raises when and if they can sustain that, especially in the midst of an economy that we're facing right now. That, that's a really good point. It's one-time money. And another thing to think about when you, when you think about teacher salaries at this point, teachers have their contracts in place. You know, they've negotiated their contracts with school districts. So would a school district want to reopen the contract process and put money into pay raises? Maybe not. What they might do, I suppose, is a possibility is they could reopen the process and give teachers a one-time bonus. You know, then you're spending one-time money. You're not building it into the salary base. We've seen that happen, you know, numerous times, not just with education, where, you know, a public agency will put one-time money into, uh, into bonuses for staff as opposed to permanent, uh, permanent pay raises that are built into the salary base. When it comes to the CARES Act, you were saying this, Kevin, that there is a chunk of money that is going to higher education as well. Although the CARES Act has already given quite a bit, if not all of that money, correct, to the universities and colleges, of which when they gave that chunk of money, half of it basically had to go directly to students themselves to try and help the students and not just for university or college programs. Is there any more of this money being siphoned off to higher education? It doesn't look that way. Uh, when the governor announced his plans to put money into K-12, I asked about higher education and he, he said that the money that has already been put into higher ed uh, under the CARES Act, he feels has offset some of the problems for higher education. And 
what he said basically was, you know, I can't keep everybody whole. Uh, there's, you know, I'd love to solve everybody's problems and, and keep every agency whole, but we just can't do it. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's an important distinction to draw here. The governor looked at the $99 million in cuts for K-12, and he's seeing the CARES Act money as a way to maybe offset that $99 million cut. Higher education took a $15 million cut in this as well. No immediate offset coming from the feds. I want to bring in a couple of comments before we yeah. move on. Nicole is saying this to us, Kevin, uh, teachers, and I believe she had a comment earlier that she is an elementary school teacher, by the way. Teachers are having to purchase their own supplies in the classroom. How come no money is being implemented for supplies for classroom teachers like Kleenex, disinfectant wipes, hand sanitizer, soap? Nicole, I'm not sure where you teach. I don't know, of course, if this is being required of all teachers. But even before the pandemic, Kevin, every year, the going back to school stories that you and I would tell when it came to education reporting is that there is a burden on teachers to help supply their classrooms. Whether or not there's enough money coming from the school district, whatever school district, that's up for debate. But teachers themselves have always been generous in pulling out their wallets and providing for their classrooms. There is some thought that some of this federal money could go into PPE, and I don't know necessarily about classroom supplies. Right. So $10 million of the CARES Act money was earmarked for PPE. That happened back in the summer. Um, and it's interesting, and I'm glad we're, we're bringing this up because this is an important topic. Uh, when I wrote last week about some of the reopening issues in Boise and West Ada, the thing that I heard from both the school districts, and I actually heard this also at the state level uh, from you know state education stakeholders, is that the PPE issue the PPE supply issue isn't as serious. There aren't there aren't shortages, uh, widespread shortages out there in, in terms of PPE. Now, that's not to dispute what uh, what we're hearing from this commenter saying that you know teachers are having to come up with uh, with PPE coming uh, coming up with supplies to bring into the classroom as well. Because when I wrote my story about the reopening in Boise, an anecdote that I used in that story was uh, one of the nurses in one of the elementary schools put out an appeal to staff saying, you know, we may need to isolate students who are showing coronavirus symptoms and we may need to set up an isolation room. Does anybody have a baby monitor, preferably a baby monitor with a camera so that we can keep an eye on these students while they're in isolation while we're trying to figure out if we should call parents and have parents pick up a kid. So, you know, that's just, you know, it's an anecdote among so many anecdotes that we hear of of teachers being asked to bring their own supplies into the classroom or to you know, supplement what's already there. So, you know, it's, I'm sure it's happening, but what I'm hearing in the big picture is uh, that the PPE is in fairly good supply around the state and, and around the Valley. And we appreciate all the teachers who are doing all the wiping down mm -hmm. in between the classes, making yeah. sure that their that, kids in their classrooms are being safe. We hear you, teachers. That, you that is an issue it. that I heard when I did that story last week. Is that, you know, on top of everything else teachers are doing, including trying to you know come up with prep time, come up with collaboration time as they teach online as well as in the classroom. You know, part of their responsibility in many cases is to, you know, Lice all the rooms you know, and, and keep the rooms clean, keep the rooms as sanitary as you can in between classes. So that's, you know, that's one more burden uh, as teachers are going back to school this year. One of the others, and you mentioned it as we were talking just a few minutes ago, if you're just joining us, Kevin Richard here from Idaho Education News talking with me on Making the Grade. We'd love to hear your thoughts and comments, suggestions if you're dealing with online learning or if your kids have gone back into the classroom, maybe even part time, how that transition has been for you and your family, what's working, what's not working. We'd love to hear it all. Uh, but I want to get back to the strong families, strong students. This is something the governor proposed on Friday. It is part of this CARES Act money. Mm -hmm. Again, Kevin, this hasn't been signed off yet uh, with the committee that is deciding how this money works, but it's the proposal. So tell me what strong families, strong students would do. Assuming it's approved by the committee and, and the committee will, will vote on it today. Uh, this would set up a $50 million grant program for parents uh, who are you know, to have their kids at home who are struggling with the expense of having kids at home, uh, the logistics of having kids trying to learn from home. So what this would allow parents to do would be to apply for grants. And as we're scrolling here, 
the grants could be up to $1,500 per student or $3,500 per family. And that could be used to buy devices. It could be used to buy learning materials. It could be used to buy other services to help you know, offset the expense of having your children learning at home. It's still very much in the formative stage because even if it's approved today, this $50 million plan, uh, the guidelines still have to be written up. The application process still needs to be worked out. The State Board of Education is going to be working on that. You could look for that application process to kick in in October. So we don't know exactly what this is going to look like. And we don't know exactly how many parents and how many families will be able to uh, have a share of the money. The, the hope uh, state officials uh, have is that you may have about 30,000 uh, families getting a share of this $50 million. So, you know, it's very much a work in progress, but $50 million is, is quite a bit of money. And, it, you know, it's, again, part of that $313 million I wrote about this morning uh, of CARES Act money that's being put into educational support. Jamie has this question for us and, or a statement saying, we don't even know who qualifies for this money. Yeah, Kevin, right. is that true because this is right. so early on? The application process is still up in the air and what, uh, what state officials talked about on Friday was uh, to try to do some sort of a needs-based uh, application process. So you know, Jamie's right. We, we don't know exactly how this is going to work. The mechanics haven't been figured out yet. So that's something we're, we're gonna be watching very closely in, in the weeks to come so parents can know how this works, how they can apply, and if they're eligible. Well, and my question there too is that since schools have now started and we are back to school across the state of Idaho in whatever form that takes in your district, is this money for technology, is it too little too late? Well, I think for a lot of parents and a lot of families uh, where kids are in school full time, it, they may not be able to, they may not be eligible for a share of the money. I think you're right. You know, we'll, we'll see how it all plays out, but that would stand to reason that um, if you have, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, $50 million is a lot of money, but if you're, if you're talking about trying to help 30,000 families, 30,000 kids, that's about a 10th of kids in K-12 across the state. So as much money as that is, it's still limited as to how many families and how many kids can be helped. So yes, I think you're, you're probably right. I, I think when this thing all sorts out, you know, families who have their kids in school full time, they may not be eligible for a share of the money. We'll, we'll see. And of course, that's all fascinating considering what could possibly happen come winter with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So it's going to just be a fascinating process. And we'll obviously, Kevin, continue to watch it right here on Making the Grade. Let's pivot and turn to the state's largest school district, West Ada, with 40,000 students doing this hybrid learning model now of an every other day schedule in classroom and online, a quick pivot for the largest school district in the state from last week when they were in the red category and kids were at home learning and now in a yellow category. But the School Board of Trustees plans to meet this afternoon and they're going to review what should happen next with West Ada. Can you give us a little rundown on what's on the agenda for that meeting today? Right, so the, the trustees do meet this afternoon and one item that's on their agenda is the school reopening plan. Now, the chairman of the, the school board uh, told our Sammy Edge, one of our reporters here, that he doesn't anticipate that there's gonna be any change in the, uh, the back to school plan uh, that this is more of a placeholder item on the agenda, but obviously it caught our attention. So we'll be watching this West Data meeting this afternoon to see what happens, to see if uh, there are any changes to the back to school plan, because as you laid it out for first through 12th graders, what you're in right now is an alternating schedule. Uh, kids in school every other day, learning from home every other day. And you now that plan came together fairly quickly uh, last week, uh, you know, West Ada announced that they were going to open on Monday and start having kids come back to school, at least part time this week. So a, a very quick pivot, as you said, but not quick enough for some folks, including some fairly powerful legislators. Tell me what happened. There was a letter that was sent to yep. the school board of trustees for West Ada. Who sent this letter and what did they want? 13 legislators, all Republicans, all representing anywhere from Boise to Nampa. And you have to remember that West Ada is such a sprawling 
school district. I mean, it does take in parts of West Boise. It takes in all of Meridian, Eagle, Star, even takes in a sliver of Canyon County. So when you see these names and you see the towns that these legislators are, 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 you know, are from, they probably all have a chunk of the West Ada school district within their legislative districts. I'm pretty sure of that. But anyway, all 13 legislators signed on to a letter saying that they want to see West Ada open full time immediately, have all 40,000 kids back in, in class every day. And their the crux of their 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 case is that they feel like, you know, the benefits of full time learning outweigh the risks of full time learning. So you can see the full letter. I, I posted it on my blog and um, I, I attached the full letter unedited so you can see exactly what the legislators uh, want and why they're pushing for it. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of this too, it's a letter to the trustees, but it's also, it's directed in no small way to health districts and the role of health districts and whether health districts uh, have too much say in the matter of reopening schools. Uh, that's an issue that they didn't come up much in the special legislative session last month. It will come up for sure in the 2021 legislative session because you have lawmakers who are really concerned that health districts have too much power uh, over school reopening and really want to ensure that these decisions rest with elected local school trustees. So reading between the lines of this letter, I think it was you know partly directed at trustees, but definitely also directed at health districts. And let's talk politics when it comes to this letter. Of course, the politicians are the ones writing the letter. But Kevin, it's an interesting dynamic that sets up not only for the legislature come 2021 in January, but for tonight's four o'clock meeting in West Ada, where you have school board trustees who obviously were voted into their positions. They are constituents in the West Ada School District almost either at odds or having to listen to state politicians who are patrons within their own school district. It's, it's something that we don't usually see in education is where politics can really make a crossroads here. Right. And there's some definite political power behind this letter. I mean, it's not just 13 random legislators. I mean, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Winder, who may wind up being the, you know, the Senate President Pro Tem, the, the leader of the Senate, come next uh, next year. Mike Moyle, the House Majority Leader, very powerful member of the legislature. Which is like sure, uh, you know, a couple of members of the. Uh, well, I'm looking at my list here. Um, you have the Chairman of the House State Affairs Committee, Steve Harris. You have uh, you know another member of House leadership, uh, Jason Monks, who's the Assistant Majority Leader. I mean, these are folks who. You know they've got some clout at the legislature they're you know so 13 legislators who represent pieces of the school district you know it, it certainly adds a political element to this whole debate about reopening and how this uh, school district tries to remain open uh you know in the middle of this pandemic a lot of us will be watching that school board trustee mm -hmm. meeting today. It's happening online. You can find that information on the West Ada School District page. They moved the meeting to 4 o'clock, so it was originally scheduled for 3 p.m. today. Um, I believe this has been updated now to be a 4 o'clock start time. Um, I'm hoping I'm giving you the accurate information there. Um, but you can double check the special board meeting. Yes, oh, there yeah, it is. Yeah, revised yeah, to yeah, 4 p.m. Like, well, no, no, no. I don't know. I'm looking here. No, it looks like it still says 3 p.m. This is this is this is live journalism going on here. It was re okay, revised on the thir uh, 13th at 4 p.m., but it looks like it still says it's a three o'clock meeting. Whenever sure it, we'll, have it. We'll, we'll be covering it this <laughs> afternoon, we'll, we'll, we'll have it uh, virtually covered and, and we'll have a, a story out of the meeting uh, later today. The information there, too, is there on the West Ada District. If you want to sign up to be able to hear the meeting for yourself, of course, that's there as well. Let's really fast, Kevin. I want to give people the resource again that Idaho Education News has put so much effort into and will continue to do so. And I want to bring up the reopening map. So in case people weren't with us last week, Idaho Education News launched this map, which I think is brilliant because it gives parents, educators, trustees in whatever district, the ability to have this interactive situation where they'll know 
what school districts are doing day by day. So you can click on it, Kevin, and see exactly what school districts have decided. What's been the benefit of launching this for all of you? Well, I think it's something we've talked about all summer and into the fall, but with every school district and every charter kind of going its own way and you know, charting its own course in terms of reopening, we knew that this was going to be a big job for us, but also a big job for parents to just know what's going on and to have a handle of what's happening in their community and how the local decisions that are being made in their community stack up compared to the rest of the state. So this is a project um, I can't take a whole lot of credit for it. I've had very little to do with it, but our, our data guy, Randy Schrader, has uh, done yeoman's work staying on top of this. And he's updating this daily. And you can go onto our Facebook page or contact us uh, through the website. If something has changed in your community, please, please, please let us know. We will update this map. This is a living document. We want to keep it as as current and as accurate as possible because that's uh, that's how it's going to be most useful if we have uh, the most up-to-date data, up and the most up-to-date information. Uh, we're hoping this is something that, that parents uh, and, and teachers can use throughout the school year to uh, to stay current and to have a handle of what's happening all across the state. And I think it will be vital too, as numbers continue to fluctuate with the coronavirus, that people will be able to get the information of what's happening in school district next door to me, even though we're only miles apart, that they're gonna be able to, or we're hundreds of miles apart and a different school district is trying something else. So this right. is the kind of hard data that I really appreciate because I can then analyze for myself and make wise decisions for me, my kids, and what happens in our school district. And the color coding gives you a sense at a glance of how the health districts are defining the coronavirus risk in counties. As you look at it right now at this hour, there's only one county in the state that's in that red risk level, that's Payette County. And we've been tracking Payette County. Their, their case numbers have been increasing steadily all through the summer. Um, you can see a lot of orange surrounding Payette County. You see pockets of orange around uh, you know, the central eastern part of the state, a lot of yellow and some green. You know, that gives you a sense really at a glance of what's happening with the coronavirus spread in your community and how it stacks up statewide. So there's a lot of good information there, and we will try to keep that information as current as we can. All right, let's bring in a couple more comments before I let you go, Kevin. I'd like you to see some of these. Um, Cody is saying that uh, my son is loving being back at school at future school part time. It has really jumped his self-esteem. And we have talked about this over and over again. Cody, I'm, I'm so excited for your child because there is the balance here between not only learning and learning in the classroom and how everyone does not doubt that for most children, and most teachers, that is probably the best scenario. It's why education has been done this way since day one. But there's the mental health aspect too, and a peer-to-peer -peer aspect that all parents and all school districts are wrestling with too, because we don't want our children isolated. No, no. I, I think everybody in the education community knows what parents know, that you know, kids really do best in that setting with their classmates, with their teachers face-to-face. I think we all know that that's where we want to get to. How we get there is the big challenge. There is an interesting point here. I want to bring this in. Um, Rebecca is saying parents have the option to do remote learning for those concerned. I assume she's saying concerned with coronavirus. Where is the option for full learning in person? Which that's an interesting flip on the discussion, of course. You know, would would there be that chance as we move forward that Perhaps, you know, a school district who goes to full open learning might see an increase in people trying to get into their district, Kevin. Yeah, no, no district or charter that I know of has 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 done that, has kind of turned the tables on this question. I mean, could it happen? Sure. Anything is possible at this point where districts and charters are, are figuring this out individually. You know, who knows? Who knows what we're, what we're going to be looking at between now and in the spring? Rodney saying, West data and local politicians tend to forget that most homes have working parents and single parents who have to also prioritize their work schedule to make ends meet. And some corporate businesses don't allow the flexibility with scheduling. We get that. 
how can these plans support those parents who are struggling already? So I don't know if Rodney, you're making reference to the West Ada meeting that's probably going to be happening today, but we get it. And this has been one of the points of contention, not only for the student's best interest, but also what parents can manage in their own homes or not manage. Yeah, I mean, if look at what's happened in West Ada and we're only in the second week of the school year. You've gone from full online learning to blended learning, alternate days. We'll see how long that lasts. We'll see if West Ada can pivot to, to full-time open or if they're gonna have to stay in this alternating plan for, for some time, or if they can even do that, we, we just don't know. And, you know, I, I feel like we say this every week about how much uncertainty there is about the coronavirus and about the outbreak and what's, uh, what, what could come this fall and winter, we just don't know. So there's no good answer uh, to that question. And that's one of the big questions with this whole reopen is how are parents gonna juggle a changing schedule, there's no easy answer. And there really isn't. There's not. And as Kevin and I have said on Making the Grade over and over again, our hearts go out to you, parents, teachers, everybody who's just trying to figure this out. Yeah. So one of the reasons we end on such a ridiculously silly note, and I realized, Kevin, I forgot to ask you last week about your no, socks. And I am no. completely remiss in doing that because I was all caught up in what was happening with technology and West Ada and how crazy online schooling was for so many kids that I forgot the most fun part of our segment, mm -hmm. which is totally mm -hmm. ridiculous and has nothing to do with education. I can understand why you're distracted. So, I'm glad you're in a little bit better, you know, better, you know, less distracted state. I get it. You know, like, I mean, that's the point, right? Is that, oh. yes, I'm a journalist. Yes, we have jobs. We get it. We're parents. We're trying to figure this out as best we can as well. So, and on that note, that's why I have to look at Kevin's socks because <laughs> I miss being in studio with him where I could make fun of his socks and you guys would never know it because he'd walk in with new socks every time in my studio. But now he's across town from me. I know. So here we go. Here we go. These are soccer socks. Soccer, soccer. I love it. I love it. For people who don't know, oh, by the way, Nicole loves them as well. Oh. She wanted to see the socks. Thanks, Nicole. So. Thank Thanks, you. Nicole. Yeah, we appreciate it. But yeah, this, you know, that's how we have fun around here. Um, Kevin, for people who don't know your obsession with soccer, would you like to tell them uh, your favorite team? And are you watching some of the European soccer that's happening? I, I am. I, I watch some European soccer. I kind of have some favorite uh, European teams. Um, Kind of also a fan of American soccer. Uh, Seattle Sounders are my favorite American team, so I, I'm I'm watching that. And you know, soccer was actually the first sport to come back in this whole you know coronavirus shutdown. You know, uh, European leagues returned in the spring, not with fans and in, in, in attendance, kind of like what we're seeing right now with with pro football in, in America and what we're seeing with baseball in America. So soccer was the first game out of the gate. And for somebody who's been a fan for years, I was, you know, that was great. So juggling European soccer, American soccer with uh, American sports uh, as it comes back, it's, it, it is nice to have stuff to watch <laughs> in addition to watching it is. the border open and closed. I have to admit my family are Cardinals baseball fans and we let the kids stay up late last night because you know what? We were doing at home learning this morning and we needed to see the end of the baseball game. So got to have a balance in your life, right? We definitely do. Kevin, thank you, as always, for your socks and your expertise and your incredible reporting that you and the entire staff do at Idaho Education News. Again, we appreciate the hard facts, the hard data and the truth that you continue to share about education in Idaho so all of us can make the best decisions possible. Thank yes. you, my friend. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks for being here for making the grade, everybody.